So sometimes people can get infection in their spine or if they've had any exposure to TB. Uh, so some of these things can uh, result in infection in the spine. The females usually have higher chance of um, getting frozen shoulder, especially when they've had a previous injury and they didn't manage properly or they've been pretty immobile. Hi, I'm Dr. Colum. I'm a neurosurgeon and I specialize in spine problems. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm a physiotherapist and um, I've, I was trained in Pilates, so um, I focus on getting people to move better with movement. So the most common neck problems that I would see would be people coming uh, with muscle strains or problems related to their posture. So these would be the most common uh, causes of neck pain that we see. So this would typically occur in people who have some sort of sports injuries, perhaps carrying heavy loads. Or sometimes if people are not mindful of their posture, they may be spending a lot of time in the office with a poor posture, or they may be having excessive uh, use of their mobile phones in an awkward posture, or sometimes the sleeping position can also be a factor. And then the second most common one that we would see would be a pinched nerve in the neck. So people might have a slip disc or some bone spurs that might cause nerve compression. And this would typically present with neck pain. And then sometimes it might also cause pain shooting down one of the arms, sometimes some numbness or pins and needles in the, in the arm, and then sometimes also weakness. So this will be also quite a common problem that we see. And then the third most common condition that we see regarding the neck would be where there is actually compression of the spinal cord. So this is a more serious uh, condition. Uh, this is often also due to a slip disc or some bone spurs in the spine and people can typically present uh, with neck pain. Uh, they also may get some numbness in their hands and feet, or they may have clumsiness of their hands, or they may have problems with walking, so they may have unsteady walking. And in some severe cases, they may also have problems with the bowel and bladder control. So these will be the common neck uh, conditions that I would see. Of course, there can be some overlap with shoulder problems also. So it's important that we can distinguish between problems arising in the neck versus the shoulder. And I think Jasmine will touch a little bit more on the shoulder problems. Yeah, so um, probably top three shoulder problems that I see um, usually first frozen shoulder. And up to now, we still don't really know what caused frozen shoulder to happen, but it occurs mainly and females usually have higher chance of um, getting frozen shoulder, especially when they've had a previous injury and they didn't manage properly or they've been pretty immobile. And then the second one will be shoulder impingement. And touching on what you mentioned earlier on where you know you see more people with um, impingements where they use mobile phones, I think I've been seeing that quite a lot now, especially in our um, working crowd. Um, it's a combination of neck and shoulder pain that's also largely due to uh, postural problems like how they actually you know slouch and, and they always put their heads really down um, due to work and also it could be due to all the ergonomics at the office which might not be ideal that got them to um, get into that, that adaptive posture that's largely due to, to, to work environment which can be corrected as well as um, and, and strengthening and all and in more severe cases probably back to surgery and then um, yeah, that's probably the top few um, shoulder problems that I've been seeing in the last couple of years, especially. So I think the most important thing is actually the history taking. So this is where we get a detailed account of the patient's symptoms. So we look at the area of the pain, any areas that the pain may be radiating to, uh, what type of pain it is, uh, when it began, how often it's occurring and how long it lasts. And we also try to get a sense of how severe the pain is and whether there's any aggravating or relieving factors. And then of course, we also look at uh, the patient's uh, past medical history, any medications they may be taking, any other symptoms that they may have associated with the pain. And we will also see what sort of treatments they've already tried. And then importantly, we also try to tease out uh, to make sure that there's no concern for any underlying serious conditions. Uh, so these are the most important things uh, in terms of the history taking for the patient's symptoms. And then after that will be the physical examination. So for the neck problems, we will usually assess uh, the patient's posture and their walking pattern. Then we will look at their neck movements, their shoulder movements. Uh, we will assess for any tender areas. And then we will also uh, test the neurological function to make sure that there's no signs of any nerve or spinal cord compression. So this will be the main part of the uh, physical examination. 
And then after that, we have special tests uh, such as X-rays, MRI scans or CT scans. X-rays are often uh, quite easy to do and widely available. So a lot of patients will already do X-ray when they go to see their GP or go to the polyclinic or if they've been to a chiropractor, they will already have x-rays. And the x-rays uh, allow us to look at the alignment of the spine and allow us to look for any significant degeneration in the joints between the bones or in the discs between the bones. And then additionally, if we have any concerns and we want to get additional information about the discs or the joints, the ligaments, and also the nerves and the spinal cord, we can request an MRI scan and that will allow us to give an accurate diagnosis of the problem. So for me, um, it will be more movement um, focused. So of course, um, first to rule out all these other um, pre-existing conditions, for example, um, the most common one would be you know, heart attacks, for example, they might, because when you have heart attacks, usually on the left side um, of the arm or on the chest. So when people come in and they have like um, left shoulder, left chest pain, we'll try to rule um, heart attacks out first and then um, and also to make sure that there is no other um, nerve involvement so for example i'll ask questions whether there's radiating pain or is there any existing numbness or, or tingling and the duration as well so of course the longer the duration the more severe the problem um, might be and of course um, that can also help to get the sense of whether there's any impingement happening there and um, also the past history, whether they've had any um, histories of um, stress fractures or, or degeneration of the disc or, or, or the joint itself. And after ruling that out, um, I'll go and look at the movements and see how um, the um, shoulder and the neck is actually moving because I find that they actually work together. <laughs> so to just make sure that, you know, it's, it's specifically, it's either the neck or is it shoulder or is it a combination of both. But I always try and rule out all the other nerves of structures that's actually affecting all these pains first. And if the pain doesn't go away, meaning there is no um, improvement in the pain at all, then I would get the patients to go for further scans. My protocol is not to get them to go to the scans right away, just to minimize um, patients from getting um, exposed to radiation unnecessarily. So if there's no history of falls or um, impaction or any um, high impact um, activities. Usually after asking specific questions, we will rule out that there's any stress fracture or any bone fractures as per se, and then we'll start to treat them first. And if it doesn't get better, then we'll get them on to do um, specific scans. I think it's uh, important, like you said, in the rare cases where there may be other serious causes that we outrule those causes. Uh, so that's an important uh, point. And then also, as you say, not everybody needs to rush to have an MRI scan or X-ray. Yeah. Um, because most people with neck pain actually it will be self-limiting yeah. and with some physiotherapy treatment uh, they may actually get back to normal fairly quickly so not everybody requires expensive investigations or not everybody needs to come and see a specialist <laughs> like me <laughs> I mean I mean to add on because you know muscles I think a lot of people don't um, they have gone for massages and all they've found that they've got tight knots and stuff but they don't really know what all these tight knots actually mean and these tight muscle knots actually do have radiating properties what i mean by that is you know if you actually put a sustained pressure over the the acupressure point or that lumpy muscle if you can say on um, the trigger point you actually feel some radiation of of pain or it feels like heat sometimes and when you find these these trigger points they actually can radiate to different parts of the body and it can feel like a a heart attack because it goes right to the front. So if there's existing trigger points that go over the similar areas, we'll be able to to differentiate that to let the patient know that oh no, it's not it's not heart attack. It's maybe just you know really stressed out muscles. So by loosening up these muscle tensions, that will give them a lot of relief. Then we know that it's definitely more of a mechanical problem than a specific bone or, or heart heart issue. So I think one of the initial things would be uh, activity modification. So some patients may require a short period of rest if they've got acute pain. And obviously we will avoid, uh, advise them to avoid any exacerbating factors or triggers for their pain. And then also we will recommend that they become more conscious of their posture. So for instance, if it's an office worker, we may recommend that they look at their desk ergonomics to make sure they have the best setup to avoid any strain on their neck. And then also maybe to be conscious of the sleeping posture. These are some of the initial uh, things we would look at. And of course, uh, some patients may need to take some painkillers. Uh, so initially we would recommend just taking simple painkillers like paracetamol or ibuprofen, which is an anti-inflammatory uh, painkiller. And these are over-the-counter medications. Some patients may also benefit from muscle relaxants 
or if they have nerve pain, they may benefit from taking um, specific nerve pain uh, relievers. And then obviously a lot of patients will also benefit from physiotherapy. So we will usually recommend that they uh, consider doing physiotherapy. And then a small percentage of patients, uh, depending on the problem, if it's just a muscle strain or poor posture, usually this will all improve with physiotherapy. But if there are some situations where there is uh, concerns for nerve compression or spinal cord compression, uh, then we have to look at other things that might be necessary, such as the investigations like MRI scan or x-rays. And then a small percentage of patients, if they really have troublesome symptoms, uh, despite the medications, physiotherapy, and if they have any nerve compression or spinal cord compression, uh, they may actually require further treatments. So sometimes to manage pain, they may require some steroid injections. And then a small percentage of people uh, may actually require surgery for troublesome symptoms, but that's only the minority of patients with neck pain. Most people will actually improve uh, without the need for any interventions with the more simple measures like uh, short-term medications and physiotherapy. To build on that um, for surgical interventions, for me, when my patients need to go for surgical interventions, I will always tell them that rehab, um, prehab is also as important so that the recovery will be way faster. So what I mean by prehab is making sure they are moving well and start to get into the practice of moving properly and efficiently so that they can get all the muscles that's necessary strengthened to as much as possible. Then after the surgery, it will be easier for them to, to recover way faster. So surgery is a great way to help for certain cases, but you can't just you know rely on the surgery and not choose to do anything after that. So I think um, being self-conscious and being um, working on our own body efficiency is really, really important as well for surgical cases. And then for me, um, I always prioritize how uh, one moves. Like I think people need to move efficiently. So I'll assess how they, they move and then how the muscles are, are working or not working one another. So in, in terms of um, like tight muscles, I'll use um, dry needling to actually release the tension and then I'll get to mobilize the joints, loosen them up and then get them to move um, well and then make sure they learn how to adapt it properly in terms of when they're at home or in the office and then um, just to promote moving better. So we can use lots of other interventions, for example, traction for um, cervical cases, neck cases where there's nerve impingements, or we can also use other um, modalities, um, ultrasound for, for inflammatory um, cases, and also um, um, other modalities to help with um, the pain and help with the muscle tightness. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that surgery is not necessarily a cure, mm -hmm. a, a lifelong cure. So definitely the rehabilitation uh, following surgery is important to you know, aid the recovery and then also to minimize the risk of further problems in the future. Yeah. Uh, so most people will still need rehabilitation even after surgery. I mean, I'm pretty sure you find sometimes people might be quite taboo when it comes to surgery, but I always will say if it's necessary, you have to, to do it just so to minimize the downtime mm. and the pain that you're suffering yeah. for, for way too long. And if it leave it for too long, surgical interventions sometimes might not even be appropriate, right? Yeah, I mean, most patients uh, that we do surgery for, they're quite grateful that they eventually chose to have surgery because it helps them to recover faster mm. and get back their quality of life rather than continual suffering. I think for me, that's something I've come to to a step over the last couple of years, especially in the recent years um, where surgical interventions is important to a certain extent. So it's not like, you know, surgery is bad, but I think at a certain point, surgical intervention is definitely way better than compared to the pain that you are suffering for, for like months and years. So uh, I think this is carrying on a little bit from what we discussed earlier, that we don't want to miss anything uh, serious when it comes to these sort of problems. Uh, so like Jasmine mentioned earlier, we definitely want to spot people having a heart attack or having uh, any serious problems like uh, meningitis or having any brain hemorrhage or things like that. There's a small percentage of cases that people will have some underlying uh, conditions that we need to be able to diagnose and treat uh, to prevent them from having uh, serious uh, sequelae. And some of the things that we will always uh, try to outrule or at least uh, keep in the back of our minds is to make sure people don't have things like any tumor, that there's no fractures in their spine. So there's a number of questions that we will typically ask and we will be concerned if people have very severe pain or pain that's continuing to get worse uh, despite uh, medications and physiotherapy. 
and if people don't get any relief of their pain whatsoever with a period of rest that would also be of concern and then in terms of tumors uh, sometimes if people have a history of cancer or if they have unexplained weight loss uh, this might be a concern that they could have a tumor in their spine and also if they have something called uh, nocturnal pain so this is actually pain that's present at night time so it's pain that typically wakes people up in the middle of the night and perhaps during the daytime actually they may not have so much pain but they wake up consistently at night time uh, because of the pain then this could uh, mean that there is an underlying tumor so we have to investigate for these kind of things and then of course if patients have a history of trauma if they have a car accident or a fall uh, we need to consider whether there could actually be a fracture which might need uh, treatment and then the last one is infection so sometimes people can get infection in their spine so we will ask whether they've had any recent infections in other parts of the body uh, if they have any medical conditions or taking any medications that might dampen their immune system or if they're having uh, fevers so these might be uh, concerns or if they've had any exposure to TB uh, so some of these things can uh, result in infection in the spine so these are the things that we would typically look at uh, to make sure that we're not uh, missing any underlying serious conditions and I'm sure uh, Jasmine may have a similar thought yeah, thank you for sharing about all the systemic uh, um, uh, things to look out for. So pretty similar. And then for, for me, I always ask about night pain because if there's any um, resting night pain, um, likely there would be some inflammatory mm. response happening. So um, that would lead me back to checking with them or is there any form of um, um, injury that you've had probably previously that you might not have known. And I think weight loss definitely, we always look out for like um, recent sudden weight loss that usually... Um, kind of hints that there might be some form of growth or, or tumour happening. For treatment sessions, basically, I'll give them about three sessions. Like if there's zero <laughs> improvement, then I think you might need to seek um, um, alternative help, which I mean go to the doctor or hospital to get a more thorough check because if not gotten any better after three sessions, I think we need to, to, to check, have, have further tests to make sure that there's nothing more happening. Yeah. yeah. So these are, I think, what we call the red flags. Uh, yeah. So if people have any of these so-called red flags, then they may need more urgent attention and assessment. Yeah, and, and I guess, like, for example, if I'm treating more neck-based, I'll make sure that I clear all the other, you know, dizziness or um, other neural, um, neural conditions that's affecting balance or their, their look out for the eyes. And, you know, if, if it's not the normal responses that um, I see, then I'll usually send them off. Things that are not, that are not usual, I guess. So that's for the neck or any um, weird uh, um, radiation patterns that they like, you know, um, because the muscles, like I mentioned earlier, they have a specific radiation pattern when it comes to muscle tightness. But if it's kind of like not the usual ones that they see, then um, we might get them off to, to get it checked as well. So I think the most important thing is to uh, emphasize to patients that uh, they should really have a, a good, healthy, active lifestyle. So this is definitely important uh, for you know, long-term general health, but also for helping with any neck or back problems. Uh, also emphasizing the importance of regular exercise. Uh, so this should be in the form of uh, strength training. And uh, anybody can actually do strength training uh, regardless of their age but the emphasis always has to be on the form of the exercises rather than being obsessed with uh, carrying heavy weights so the form is really important and particularly if you have any neck or back problems uh, you don't want to have exercises where you're putting undue strain on your neck and then obviously incorporating some cardio exercises and also making sure that there's some time set aside for maintaining the flexibility of the spine and, and stretching so this is also very important and then some of the lifestyle factors, uh, if people are overweight, uh, if they can lose some weight, it may help with their neck or back problems. And likewise, if people consume a lot of alcohol or active smokers, uh, they may want to consider stopping to help for their long-term health. And then of course, avoiding any triggers for the pain that they may be getting. And then also being more conscious of their posture. So in their daily life, whether it's their normal activities or whether it's their work environment or their home environment, just to generally be more conscious of these things. I think this will all help uh, with uh, preventing further problems in the future. 
Can I just ask a question? Um, because I always get asked a lot with regards to like smoking and, and drinking. Oh, what, what has that got to do with um, my neck and shoulder pain? Right, it's okay, okay. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is just general lifestyle measures for maintaining generally good health. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I think it's been shown that uh, people who obviously are overweight or if they consume a lot of alcohol, they're at risk for other medical problems and uh, definitely their uh, problems with say back pain will, will decrease if they can manage some of these risk factors and uh, I think smoking is, is definitely been shown to be associated with a lot of negative effects so even in terms of spine health I think uh, if people stop smoking it, it helps with their um, with their bone health and also particularly if patients do end up having surgery uh, for whatever reason, actually the healing following surgery is definitely uh, affected in people who are actively smoking. So I think there's a, a number of factors, but uh, it's definitely something that has to be encouraged to stop smoking, even if, if someone just has some neck strain. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of general uh, health, uh, it's a good, it's a good uh, opportunity for us as healthcare professionals to promote uh, healthy living also. Yeah, because sometimes when they come into pain, they're like, I'm in so much pain already. And then after all these things I need to do, you're asking me to stop smoking, <laughs> stop drinking. So, I mean, to me, I explain to them, like, all these um, smoking and drinking excessive might also cause, like, a, an irritation to the system, the nervous system. So that might also start to make the whole nervous system quite heightened. And then any responses seem to be um, a bit excessive in terms of like if I just have a little gentle touch, they might feel very, they might feel like the pain is like 10 times more than usual. So it kind of makes the whole system a bit irritated. So that's how I explain it to them. So what I would actually recommend for them is to actually first thing to be aware of the posture first. Like if it's not broken, we don't fix it. But the fact that you're here to, to get something fixed, so we need to work on something. So. <clears throat> look through their posture, make sure that you know what is neutral, where the head is in relation to the whole whole body. And then that's in the resting position. And then I'll get them to go through how they should be sitting at work, how they should be standing, and then next thing, moving on to moving. This will take a couple of weeks, so it's not a one-day thing. So I always tell them, it took you years to become like that. It will take you a couple of weeks to unwind everything. So after getting them used to um, how they are supposed to be moving, I'll start to recommend doing um, specific exercises that is particular to them in relation of um, strengthening certain areas just so that the body parts can can work together well. Because I think especially office workers, things happen when the whole system is kind of like not working in sync. So like so maybe the back is getting more tight or the shoulders at the front is getting more tight. That's why all the the funny posture starts happening. So I recommend um, exercise, like you said, um, just be active. Don't have to specifically go for like a gym because some of them don't even walk out of the house <laughs> besides going to work. So I'll just get them to just start moving basically to stretch in the most um, effective manner in a good posture or just just lift um, your water bottle at home. You don't have to go out to pay for membership or for gym. You don't even want to start exercising. So something small first. Because I'm trained in Pilates, so um, my rehab is usually movement, movement related. And then the next thing I'll check is um, their pillows to make sure that they have a, a pillow that's um, uh, supportive for their neck. I'm not saying you need to get expensive pillows, but pillows that are supportive for an individual. So I'll guide them through how our neck has um, a little bit of a curve of your neck. So there's a bit of a curve here. Okay, so we need to make sure that when we are sleeping, you know, the pillow is able to support our neck adequately. So um, that will require some shopping and research um, to make sure that it can actually support that, that curve when you are sleeping on the side or on your back. And the next thing would also get them to take a look at their mattress, whether it is too soft or too hard. Um, not that you have to change it right away, but if it's too firm and it's affecting your back, I will get them to probably place like a, 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 a pillow underneath their thigh just to break that straight line up so that your back can have some rest. Because if the, the mattress is too stiff, sometimes we end up being really straight and then if their back is really very curved, they might end up in this arch position throughout the whole time. Then they're not actually being, being um, the back's not being rested. So they'll actually wake up feeling even more sore. So if that happens, I'll get them to just place a pillow underneath, um, underneath the ties and then for checking their pillow. And then um, the last one would be ergonomics. So um, I've gone, gone into offices a lot to take a look at their workstation. So I'm not saying you have to have a standing desk, but it depends on what's happening. So I'll get, talk them through, um, recommend the 1990 rule where you, know, um, you have the screen 
probably maximum one arm length away, your elbows at 90 degrees, um, hip and knees at 90 degrees, so make sure that your legs are propped up if you're too far away from the, the floor, or bring your chair closer to the desk so that you can um, place your elbows close to the desk. Um, have a wrist pad to make sure that everything is supported. Have a pillow behind your back and your chair if you're, you tend to be a little bit too arched up or a bit too curved. So all these things can help to um, minimize strain, especially when you're working. And also to remind them to get up and stretch every hour or two, just so that they don't get stuck at the desk for too, too long. I think it's important uh, to emphasize, like you said, no need to go and buy expensive gym memberships or buy expensive pillows or mattresses. So. <laughs> Uh, a lot of things in terms of exercise can be done with simple things at home and then uh, with a little bit of research uh, things like pillows and mattresses can find an ideal one without without spending a lot of money. I actually would get them to a simple cheap trick first to just roll up a towel and then um, if it's not enough we roll up a thicker towel and to, to find to kind of find which um, size actually suits you and then once they kind of like know then they kind of know roughly or oh, what kind of a a uh, height of a arc do I need for my neck support when I sleep? So I'm going to try with a, a roll-up towel first. Do you generally recommend contoured pillows for people with neck problems? Um, it depends because I, I do think some people don't respond as well um, to contour pillows, especially mm. when they have really, really flat necks. Mm. Because the contour pillows have a, a contour already. And then if you force them to get onto that, it might actually make them feel worse. So mm. for those cases, I probably start with really let roll up towel first and slowly increase that before I chuck them off to a really <laughs> because then they will they will get even more more pain yeah. yeah but I think one thing about the contour pillows is there's two sides right so I think a lot of people didn't know um, let me just mention it the shorter side is for back sleepers because when we're sleeping with our back our neck is not too arched up and then the higher side is for side sleepers where when we are lying on our side our neck is actually a bit more curved, so we need a higher support. So there's a there's a difference um, to the different heights. And of course, people ask me, oh, but I sleep and I move all the time. Do I wake up and change it? Um, no, because if you're comfortable, you actually won't be tossing and turning. So that's the the, the, the base now of sleep. If one's comfortable, you will be sleeping throughout in that, in that position. So I probably think it's either your mattress that's not working for you or your pillow is not working for you. So we just need to work that out. Mm -hmm.